Dimitrios Georgios Akestoridis is a Ph.D. candidate in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. He is advised by Professor Patrick Tagg as a member of the MUSE Group and Scilab. He received his BSc and his MSc degrees in computer science from the University of Ioannia in October 2013 and February 2016, respectively. During the summer of 2016, he was a visiting researcher at the University of St. Andrews where he was working on the CRAWDAD Research Data Archive. He began his doctoral studies on the Silicon Valley campus of Carnegie Mellon University in August 2017 and transitioned to the Pittsburgh campus in August 2020. Akestoridis has publicly released several data sets and software tools that he has developed as part of his research in wireless communications, network security, and embedded systems. Please welcome Mr. Akestoridis. Hello, everyone. I'm Dimitrios, and I'm a PhD candidate at Carnegie Mellon University. In this talk, I will present the approach that Madhumitha, Michael, Patrick, and I followed in order to analyze the security of Zigbee networks using Zigator and GNU Radio. First of all, Zigbee is a wireless communication protocol that is built on top of the IEEE 802.15.4 standard to enable low-rate wireless mesh networking. Zigbee is utilized by numerous smart home devices such as smart locks and smart outlets mainly because Zigbee focuses on achieving low power consumption and low manufacturing cost. Furthermore, uh, Zigbee supports two security models in order to provide a balance between usability and security. The first security model is the distributed security model which is recommended for ease of use while the second one is the centralized security model, which is recommended for higher security. Given that Zigbee devices typically interact with the physical world through sensors and actuators, it is important to ensure that they meet appropriate security goals because they can also affect the physical security of smart home residents. For example, consider a smart home with Zigbee-enabled door locks. If the Zigbee network is not properly secured, then an attacker may be able to unlock these door locks without proper authorization. So recently, we studied the security consequences of disabling MAC layer security in centralized Zigbee networks. In particular, we demonstrated a set of passive and active attacks that uh, centralized Zigbee networks are exposed to due to this design choice. However, in this presentation, we will primarily focus on the design of our testbed, which enabled us to conduct our analysis. Starting with the most fundamental functionality that we need for our testbed, that is the ability to capture uh, Zigbee packets, generally speaking, we have two options. We can either use a dedicated IEEE 802.15.4 transceiver or we can use a software-defined radio. In the case of a dedicated transceiver, we can use for example an ATUSB with its default firmware uh, and TCP dump to capture Zigbee packets. Or we can also use an RZUSB stick with the Killer B firmware and tools. Alternatively, we can use a software-defined radio to capture IQ signals and perform demodulation in software with GNU Radio. So for our testbed, we decided to use a software-defined radio, and in particular a USRP N210, because the ability to capture IQ signals allowed us to also analyze the effectiveness of the jamming attacks that we implemented. Now, once we have captured a set of Zigbee packets, we often want to inspect them using Wireshark. However, we were not aware of any widely used profile for Zigbee traffic, so we developed our own. The screenshot on this slide showcases a few of the coloring rules as well as columns uh, that our profile displays. However, to make this uh, screenshot more legible, we had to slightly increase the text size and hide some of the columns that are uh, displayed by default with our profile. 
Moving on to the second uh, functionality that we need for our testbed, which is the ability to inject arbitrary packets, uh, we can easily uh, achieve that uh, using GNU Radio and SCAPI. More specifically, we can use the GNU Radio Companion flow graph that is shown on this slide to not only inject uh, forged uh, Zigbee packets, but also to store captured Zigbee packets in pickup format. And this is made possible uh, using two key blocks from the GR IEEE 802.15.4 and GR FOO modules that are written and maintained by Bastian Blossel. So regarding the uh, forging component, uh, we can see on the code snippet how easily we can forge a beacon request uh, with SCAPI. And once we have forged our desired packet, uh, we can set it over UTP to our uh, software-defined radio uh, for transmission. Uh, when we first started our research project, the latest version of SCAPI was version 2.4.3, uh, which, while it provided support for several different uh, packet types and header fields that are used in Zigbee networks, during our experiments we captured several packets that were not properly dissected. So we implement the required enhancements for SCAPI and submitted them as a pull request, uh, which was later merged into SCAPI's uh, master branch. Uh, so far, we discuss, discussed scenarios where we opted to use a software-defined radio. However, there are still cases where uh, it's much easier to achieve their desired outcome uh, with a dedicated IEEE 802.15.4 transceiver. Uh, one such case is the injection of a time-critical uh, Zigbee packet, such as the injection of a MAC acknowledgement. And we can easily achieve that by modifying uh, the firmware of an IEEE 802.15.4 USB adapter. And in our case, we decided to do that uh, with an AT USB. Similarly, another functionality that we need uh, for our testbed is the ability to selectively jump Zigbee packets. And again, we achieved that uh, by modifying the firmware of an ATUSB. Now, Bastian Blossel uh, wrote a blog post last year where he described how he was able to implement a reactive jammer and a selective jammer by modifying the firmware, the firmware of an ATUSB. However, his implementation of a selective jammer was only able to interfere uh, with packets that were destined for a specific uh, node. While for our experiments, uh, we wanted to uh, have the ability to uh, define arbitrary jamming conditions uh, for the attacks that we developed. So in order to achieve that, uh, we modified the firmware of our ATUSB as follows. First of all, the ATUSB uh, waits for an RX start interrupt, which is typically issued a few microseconds after our ATUSB receives a FI header. And as we can see, uh, when the RX start is received, uh, the ATUSB can then retrieve the length uh, of the packet that is being transmitted. And then by introducing a 32 microsecond delay, uh, the ATUSB can then retrieve the next byte of that, uh, of that packet. And by repeating that process, the ATUSB can retrieve all the bytes that are required in order to determine whether its predefined jamming condition is satisfied or not. Assuming in this case that it is indeed satisfied, uh, we then force the ATUSB to transition from the receive state to the transmit state in order to interfere with the transmission of the legitimate packet that is uh, still ongoing. Then the ATUSB uh, stops the transmission of the jamming packet shortly before uh, the legitimate packet completes its transmission. And then uh, we simply return to the receive state and wait for the next RX start interrupt to repeat that process. And this is uh, the 
a high level description of all the proof of concept attacks that we implemented uh, by modifying the firmware of our edit USB uh, which uh, we have made publicly available in a GitHub repository. The only difference is that for some of the attacks we followed the uh, jamming of a packet with the spoofing of a MAC acknowledgement to confuse the sender of the uh, legitimate packet. Now finally, uh, Zgator is a software tool that we de developed in order to gain insights from the packets that we capture. And it primarily depends on three Python libraries. The first one, which we already mentioned, is the Scapy library, which Zgator uses to parse and forge Zigbee packets. The second library is the PyCryptodom library, which uh, we are using for its AES cipher in order to then implement the cryptographic functions that are used uh, in Zigbee networks. And finally, we are also using the scikit-learn library to train decision tree classifiers. For example, uh, we wanted to train a decision tree classifier that could uh, identify encrypted packet types uh, using uh, only the unencrypted header fields that are available to an outsider. So to summarize the features that uh, Zgator provides, first of all, as we, as we already mentioned, the primary purpose of Zgator is to provide insights. So obviously Zgator uh, uh, needs to derive all the encryption keys uh, when uh, the required information is provided, as well as decrypt and verify all captured Zigbee packets. However, uh, Zgator also provides uh, the ability uh, to the security analyst to encrypt and authenticate Zigbee packets in case they are interesting in, injected, uh, in injecting forged packets that contain encrypted payload. And obviously, from all the packets that Zgator is parsing, is parsing it then uh, infers valuable information from them that we uh, uh, delineate in our YSEC paper about how it can uh, infer that information from metadata and uh, by studying the specification itself. Finally, uh, Zgator provides some uh, automation methods uh, such that we already described, such as the injection of force packets over UDP, as well as automating the launching of selective jamming and spoofing attacks with an AT USB. So to put all these components together, uh, this figure uh, illustrates how uh, we can analyze the security of a given Zigbee network uh, with uh, a software-defined radio, Zgator, and an IEEE 802.15.4 USB adapter. In particular, the software-defined radio is used uh, first to capture Zigbee packets, which we are then uh, analyzing with Zgator to better understand the nature of uh, that Zigbee traffic. And uh, from that analysis, we then develop novel selective jamming and spoofing attacks that we implement in the framework of an IEEE 802.15.4 USB adapter. And finally, when we are launching uh, these attacks to validate uh, uh, our insights, uh, we are using the software-defined radio to monitor the file, file layer and uh, study the effectiveness of these attacks. And uh, with the plot on this uh, slide, we uh, showcase how we can combine all these core functionalities, starting with the ability to capture IQ signals with a software-defined radio, which uh, resulted, in, resulted in this plot by calculating the magnitude of the captured IQ signal. So this signal was captured when the AT USB was launching an attack against the network. So we can see that initially the uh, a legitimate uh, packet is being transmitted, uh, which is the first increase in the magnitude of the captured IQ signal. 
and this is also what the ATUSB uh, received and uh, retrieved byte by byte and determined that it is a packet that uh, satisfies the jamming condition so uh, the ATUSB transitions to the transmit state to interfere with it and that's uh, the cause of the second increase in magnitude that we see in this plot and as we can observe uh, the the transmission of the jamming signal and shortly before the transmission of the legitimate packet uh, is complete. However, shortly after that, we see that the ATUSB is also transmitting another packet, which is a spoof MAC acknowledgement that it sends back to the sender of that legitimate packet. So for our experiments, uh, we use 10 commercial Zigbee devices to study the traffic that they generated. And uh, we, in particular, we conducted eight experiments where we varied the, the Samsung SmartThings Hub that was used for its experiment, as well as the topology of the devices. And from these experiments, we generated a data set that contains over 500,000 valid packets and uh, it lasted uh, a little over 34 hours in total. And this dataset is uh, publicly available to download from the Crowdat Research uh, Data Archive. So, uh, using uh, this testbed, the main vulnerability that uh, we discovered allows the attacker to disconnect any Zigbee device from its network. So this is uh, what I will try to uh, describe uh, using this simple uh, Zigbee network that consists of three, three Zigbee devices. The Zigbee coordinator, the Zigbee router, and the Zigbee end device. And we are using their initials to label them. And to the right, we see the attacker that is configured to use the same PAN ID, uh, which stands for Personal Area Network Identifier, and a different extended PAN ID than uh, the victim's network. And the attacker can easily uh, learn these values because uh, the, the Zigbee devices are transmitting them in their packets unencrypted. So the attack starts uh, with the attacker uh, broadcasting a beacon that, uh, as we already mentioned, uh, uh, uses the same PAN ID, but a different extended PAN ID in its uh, header fields. And that causes the Zigbee router to identify it as a PAN ID conflict. So it transmits a network report packet to the Zigbee router to inform it about that uh, PAN ID conflict. The Zigbee coordinator then acknowledges that network report and selects a new PAN ID for its network. And as it prepares to uh, broadcast uh, that, uh, that new PAN ID value, the attacker interferes uh, with the transmission of the network update command, which contains this new PAN ID value to prevent the Zigbee router and the Zigbee end device from learning that new value. So they're remained uh, using the, the old PAN ID value in this case. And the attacker is able to selectively jump this network update command because as we saw in our YSEC paper, it is the only network layer uh, command that can have a payload of 12 bytes. And according to the specification, shortly after the Zigbee coordinator uh, broadcasts uh, this network update command, it automatically switches to the PAN ID that it selected while the other uh, devices uh, remain using uh, the old PAN ID because the attacker interfered with the transmission of the network update command. So now when the Zigbee router on the Zigbee end devices, the Zigbee end device attempts to send a message to the coordinator, the Zigbee coordinator is going to ignore that packet because it now uses a different PAN ID value. However, normally we would expect that uh, both the Zigbee router and the Zigbee end device would try to rejoin uh, the network with the new PAN ID once they realize that they cannot communicate 
with their Zigbee coordinator anymore. And there are uh, a few options that uh, the attacker uh, has in order to keep the Zigbee devices disconnected, which we uh, described in more detail in our YSEC paper, but here I will quickly uh, summarize them. Uh, the first one is to spoof uh, mark acknowledgements for uh, uh, Zigbee end devices uh, because uh, by uh, spoofing mark acknowledgements for the data requests that are periodically transmitting, the Zigbee end devices then think that they are still connected to their parents, so they are not uh, initiating the return process. Alternatively, uh, the attacker could selectively jam region response commands, which we also realized that they can uh, be identified despite the use of encryption. Uh, and by selectively jamming them, uh, the uh, devices keep retrying to join the network and they never uh, complete that process successfully. However, we observe that some of our devices even when they fail to receive the region response because of our selective jamming, they still succeeded in joining their networks. But the third option that we described here worked for all of our uh, Zigbee devices, which was to selectively jam the beacons that contained the new PanID value. So in that way, uh, the devices never learned the new PanID value and they never initiated the rejoin uh, process at all. However, the reason that I mentioned uh, earlier that normally we would expect the devices to try to rejoin was that, uh, interestingly enough, we observed that some Zigbee routers did not initiate at all or significantly de delayed the rejoin process when they failed to receive the network update command. In particular, our SmartThings SmartBulb uh, did not initiate the rejoin process at all during the 38 hours that we monitored it, while our Centralite, Centralite 3 series smart outlet uh, initiated that process after about uh, 25 minutes after our uh, selective jamming of the network update command. Of course, we disclosed our findings to the Zigbee Alliance before we made them available to the public and uh, their representative responded by, first of all, uh, stating that they were aware of uh, PAN-ID conflict attacks and they have implemented specification changes that will prevent malicious PAN-ID changes in the future. As for the SmartThings Hub in particular that we use for our experiments, uh, shortly before our findings were made available to the public, a new uh, firmware version was released that uh, modified uh, the firmware of the hubs to ignore the PAN-ID conflicts uh, when they occurred. So, for example, uh, if someone tries to replicate our PAN-ID conflict attack uh, with the latest version of the SmartThing, the latest version of the firmware for the SmartThing hubs, they will observe that indeed a Zigbee router will try to uh, send a a network report uh, when a PAN-ID conflict occurs uh, to the Zigbee coordinator. However, uh, even though the Zigbee coordinator is going to acknowledge that packet, it's uh, not going to attempt to broadcast a network update command, so they will continue using the old PAN-ID regardless whether the PAN-ID conflict was uh, malicious or legitimate. So in conclusion, uh, the testbed design that uh, we presented enables independent security analysts to analyze the security of Zigbee networks in depth. In particular, uh, we opted to use a software-defined radio for capturing Zigbee packets as well as to inject non-time critical uh, packets, such as beacons and beacons requests. While the, for the injection of time critical packets like uh, MAC acknowledgements, uh, we used an IEEE 802.15.4 USB adapter. And similarly, uh, we used that dedicated uh, IEEE 802.15.4 transceiver to also selectively jam uh, Zigbee packets.
As for the packet analysis component, uh, our, our, our software tool uh, called Zgator was used specifically for that purpose. Uh, you can find additional resources regarding uh, that research project on our research group uh, website. And uh, if you have any further questions regarding uh, our project, uh, please uh, feel free to reach out to us over email. Thank you very much for your attention.